Thanks, Ross. So this is joint work with uh, Zhao Dongjie, Andre Cornell, Bert Lenehovius, and Michael Mislov. Okay, so we're going to be talking about variational quantum programming with the intention of being able to, you know, nicely program variational quantum algorithms, which we already heard a little bit about this week. Uh, so the main idea is that with variational quantum algorithms, uh, we're simultaneously doing classical computation and quantum computation, and you know one informs the other and so forth. And there's like a lot of papers these days where people are trying to determine if there is some computational advantage or not, and well, it's not very clear. But uh, here in this paper, we're not concerned with these matters. Uh, instead, we are considering the the problem from a type theoretic and uh, structural perspective. So what goes on here is that uh, on, the on the quantum side of things, uh, the, the, uh, the, the operations or the circuits which you have to execute are usually uh, small, whereas the, the hard part is actually done on the classical side. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, the, the, main, the, the main point is that you have to go back and forth, so you, you have to uh, switch between the two. So the question that we want to answer here is, uh, can we design uh, nice type systems such that uh, programming in this uh, uh, setting uh, makes sense? And can we interpret them? Can we derive some interesting semantic models and so on? And uh, as a motivation, well, we, if we are able to do all of this, then we can uh, hopefully discover some uh, nice design. And if you have nice design, uh, if you have nice programming uh, language design in general, it means that uh, this could uh, uh, lead to fewer bugs for programmers who, who use the system. Uh, you can end up with uh, better program logics, uh, sorry, better program logics, reasoning tools, uh, better analysis, and so forth. Okay, so what we're going to do from a type theoretic uh, point of view here uh, is to design a dual system where we're going to have classical judgments and uh, quantum judgments. Uh, but also we have to deal with uh, probabilistic effects, such as uh, pro uh, um, probabilistic effects, which are induced by uh, quantum measurements. And because of this, uh, the classical side would also inherit those uh, probabilistic effects. So when you do a measurement, then this also has an effect, of course, on the classical side once you start manipulating the information. On the, on the quantum side, we're going to use a first order linear type system, where linear here should be understood from the perspective of linear logic. So this is a substructural type system. Uh, and the reason is that uh, contraction, which is what a linear logician uh, calls uh, copying of information, is uh, inadmissible in general for uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, on the classical side, uh, we're going to use a higher order uh, classical system. Higher order here means that we're going to have lambda abstractions, so we can have functions that take other functions as input, return functions as output, and so on. And now, if, if, you're, if you consider both uh, systems uh, separately, then it's clear how to do it. I mean, we have many papers that discuss uh, both systems uh, separately, so we know how to do it. But now in this talk, we're going to consider the interaction. So how do, they, you, know, how do you switch between the two different modes of operation uh, back and forth? So this is the, the main uh, object. OK, classical system, how do we do it? So this is something that we already know. So this is basically a background slide here. In our case, what we're going to take is uh, PFPC. This is the probabilistic fixed point calculus. It's a, a very expressive system. It has function types, pair types, sum types, and recursive types, which induce recursion on terms, or it in, they induce recursion on uh, programs. Uh, and finally, for the effects, for, well, for the additional effect, is that we have a discrete probabilistic choice. Uh, but this one will actually be induced by the measurements, but still, you can, you know, you can encode the syntactic sugar into the system as well. The syntax, the operation of semantics, and the denotation of semantics Basically, you can copy paste from our Lex paper from last year, which is about classical probability, and this is what we do here as well. Now, what we did in that paper is that we constructed a submonad of the valuation monad uh, V of Jones and Plotkin. Now, this valuation monad V is uh, this is the traditional and classic way to talk about probability and recursion in uh, domain theory. But, there is an important but here, the, commut the commutativity of this monad, so commutativity is a nice property which uh, you want to have because it implies uh, uh, nice, uh, some, uh, nice uh, categorical structure on the classic category of the monad. The, com the commutativity of this monad has been an open problem since uh, 89. Uh, however, in our LIX paper, we were able to prove that the submonad which we construct is commutative 
because we are able to restrict to a class of uh, evaluations or so to say class of semantic elements that we need and the rest is like stuff that we don't care about and there we are able to prove that this one is commutative uh, as a submonad of v uh, in this uh, situation we can interpret the, the classical judgments uh, in the following way so here phi is the classical context so this is basically the the, the information you, you, can, you can you can view this as information which is uh, parametrizing the the program so it's essentially uh, a way to instantiate the free variables which are in the program m and this one if, if the program is of type is of type a then what we're going to in, the way we're going to interpret this is a, as a as a function uh, from the interpretation of the context which may be defined in a standard way to the to the interpretation of the type a again defined in well here you need to put to put in some a little bit more effort but it can be defined and then you slap the monad m uh, on this in order to uh, be able to take into a, uh, in order to model uh, probability and recursion as well so this is just a standard way to interpret uh, programs in the classic category of the monad and the function has to be scott continuous because we're working over directed complete partial orders and now if you put in some uh, more work, you define the semantics, this is, uh, okay, you, you, you write half a page or something like that. Then you, you do a little bit more work and you can prove that uh, your semantics is uh, sound in, the, in, a, in a convex uh, sense. It means that under a single step reduction where this encodes the probability of the reduction in the classical subsystem, the, the interpretation is uh, preserved. Okay, so it's just a simple uh, convex sum. Here it has at most two Simmons. Now this equation here, it's okay, it looks nice. This one is about, uh, I, I think it's more than 16 pages, uh, the proof of this one. And it says that uh, the interpretation of the program is the sum of, of a bunch of values. So these are normal forms that uh, your program can reduce to, where the, uh, where the uh, probability uh, index for each is uh, given by the overall probability of reduction in the operation of semantics. Okay, so this has been basically copy-pasted, so it's uh, background. Uh, all right, so for the quantum subsystem, again, we know how to do it separately, and this uh, uh, is achieved in the following way. So we take a linear type system, so linear in the sense of linear logic, not in the sense of uh, vector spaces, although, I mean, there's, of course, connections there as well. We have some types, pair types, and inductive types. Here, we do not have higher order functions. Uh, we do not allow this. The syntax, the operational semantics, and the denotational semantics is almost the same as, uh, as a paper uh, that we uh, published in FOSAX uh, two years ago. Uh, but uh, there is like some small differences, but they're, I would say, inessential. The main point is that we interpret everything using von Neumann algebras. So we're going to hear more about those uh, tomorrow by Robert Ferber. And earlier in the week, we already heard uh, one talk, so they're very, they're strongly related to C-star algebras as well. Uh, and von Neumann algebras, uh, they can be used to uh, study quantum information, as well, as the name suggests. Right? So there we also proved in that paper that our interpretation is uh, sound and strongly adequate as well. Now here judgments are modeled, uh, uh, so quantum programs here are modeled uh, using a uh, dual judgment, where phi is the classical part, so this is the classical information which is uh, parametrizing your circuit, so to speak. And so let's take a simple example. And gamma is the linear part of the context, which is essentially, you can view this as the input of the circuit. You know, if you take a, like a simple circuit view, but in general, this is a program, so you, you have to generalize to quantum operations and so on. And A is the type. Okay, so this is a dual intuitionistic uh, linear logic style of uh, judgment here. And now we interpret uh, those judgments as, uh, as called continuous functions from the interpretation of the nonlinear context into a category Q, which is the category of hereditarily atomic von Neumann algebras, which is a nice subcategory of uh, von Neumann algebras that we have identified. Uh, and uh, so uh, here we interpret this into the home set, which has nice structure as uh, we shall see soon. Uh, from gamma to A. So this uh, essentially means that uh, this is essentially a uh, a space of quantum operations from gamma into A that we can well, talk, uh, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, in more detail later. All right, so we already see that we can view this as, as, uh, as a bunch of quantum operations which have been parametrized by some classical information on the left. 
All right, so what's the, what's the new stuff? So, so far I have not said anything new, basically. So the new stuff is that we're going to add uh, uh, first uh, a new type, which is the type of first order quantum functions uh, from type A to type B. And for those uh, who are familiar with linear logic, uh, this can be uh, seen as uh, uh, bank, which is the, uh, uh, one of the exponential uh, modalities of linear logic applied to the linear implication of uh, A and B. But in this system, we don't have a bank and we don't have the Wally pop either, so we just introduced this type. But this is the more, morally equivalent translation to linear logic. A subset of the types are declared to be observable, uh, which are given by, uh, by the grammar here. And this corresponds to the physically observable uh, information. Uh, but also, uh, it uh, corresponds to observability in a type theoretic sense. So these are essentially the ground types. So we just have... Uh, okay, we can ignore the x variable, which is, used, which is used for recursive types. So we just have the unit type here. Here we have some types. We have pair types. And these are closed under uh, type uh, recursion as well. Or in this case, type induction. There's an obvious translation between the two. Uh, I just explained it. And here we add a bunch of terms, which allow us to uh, uh, switch between the different modes of operation. So on the first slide, we have, uh, uh, this is now a quantum, a first order quantum lambda abstraction. And it's first order because here we require that uh, you, you take into account the entire uh, quantum context uh, in one go. So for this reason, it's first order, it's not uh, higher order. This is just a function application. So this is now uh, here a classical term. This is a quantum term. So you just uh, evaluate the function at, uh, the, at the quantum term. We have a function for executing a uh, quantum uh, programs. So the C here is technically should be understood as a configuration. Uh, but the configuration for the purposes of this, of this talk, you can view as a closed quantum program. So it's a quantum program that does not have any input data which has not been specified. So it can be understood in uh, uh, isolation compared to uh, any additional information. Okay, so if you're given a closed quantum program which has observable type, then you can run it and then you, you will obtain the corresponding uh, classical observable type into your system. The init is uh, the reverse of this. So if you're, given, uh, if you're given some classical program here that computes some observable information, well then if you, init you can initialize uh, your... Uh, uh, so, sorry, here you can write the quantum program that uh, uh, does the same thing but viewed as a circuit or more generally as a quantum operation because you know, we have more general types than just uh, circuits. And finally, here we have a term called lift, which so, so some people like to call this uh, dynamic lifting. Uh, we heard about dynamic lifting earlier, and this is basically how it uh, looks like here. So the, the function R here is the continuation, whereas the, func the, the program, sorry, the, pro the term R here is the continuation, whereas the term here, uh, the term Q here is uh, what you wish to promote. Okay, so Q is a term which compute. it's a quantum uh, program which computes some observable information. If you lift it and you store the result in variable X, then what you're going to do is that you, you're, go you're going to translate the observable quantum information into the corresponding uh, classical analog and put this into the nonlinear part of the context so that you can then subsequently use it as many times as you wish in the continuation R. So that's the idea. Okay. So these are basically the newly added terms. And as you can see, this allows us to move back and forth between the classical and the quantum world. So uh, yeah, this is how we have designed the type system. So I have not said much about the operational semantics now, but we do have it. So first, I'm going to give you an overview of the categorical model so that we can understand how to perform the denotation of semantics. So the categorical model, first, you copy-paste the results from our LICS paper. This gives you uh, an adjunction between the category of DCPOs and the class category of the monad M. This is a, just a classly adjunction, so we know how to interpret programs there. Copy-paste uh, the other paper, basically, and here we have uh, von Neumann algebras uh, where the notion of morphism are, is given by the star homomorphisms, sorry, normal uh, unit of star homomorphisms. Uh, and Q is uh, von Neumann algebras with normal completely positive subunital maps. 
So the values are interpreted here. These, this is where the normal forms may be interpreted. But to interpret the terms, you need additional structure, and they're interpreted into the higher category. And here, the subcategory inclusion is, in fact, uh, well, it's basically a classically left edge joint as well. But you know, if you just copy paste two papers, you're not going to get a new one. So you have to do some more work. And for the additional connectives, we basically add the bottom plus some additional theorems that I'm going to mention next. So here, um, here we have two additional adjunctions, which, however, do not compose because the orientations are opposite, as you can see. So here, if you consider the, let's say, the connection between DCPO and Q star, since the adjunctions are, have opposite orientations, it means that you do not get the model of uh, intuitionistic linear logic here. All right, so it's a bit weaker, but uh, I also point out that uh, this is where we we'll, uh, uh, interpret the observable information. And because of this, we're actually able to get away with not having a model of intuitionistic linear logic in between the two. Uh, oh yeah, so, sorry, I want to go back. So uh, here, this is kind of obvious what it is. This is just like the obvious inclusion functor where you take a set and you send it to the discrete, to the discrete order DCPO. Whereas here, you take the L infinity functor to get a suitable volume algebra. Now, for the link between the classical and the quantum world, so I cannot get into too much details, but what uh, the main point is that here is that we use uh, Kegelspitzen, which are, uh, well, domain theoretic algebraic structures that have been introduced by uh, Klaus Kaimo and Gordon Plotkin uh, a few years ago. And the main idea there is that uh, you have a DCPO, so a direct complete partial order, which is what semantics people like to talk about, which, which also has an additional convex structure, which is compatible with the, with the, with the, with the order theoretic structure as well. Uh, an important uh, uh, class of Kegel Spitzen are the continuous ones, which are uh, just the Kegel Spitzen whose underlying uh, DCPO is a domain, or also a continuous DCPO, which are very nice DCPOs. So to take some examples, if you take a DCPO X, then, and you slap either the ML net or the VML net on the DCPO, then you also get a Kegelspitz. But if in addition, uh, you start with a domain, which is, as I said, like a very nice uh, DCPO, then the two coincide, and you also get uh, a continuous Kegelspitz in, in addition. So some of the main theorems that uh, I just quickly advertise here, which are needed to perform the semantic interpretation, uh, I, I will not have time to outline the semantic interpretation, but these uh, three theorems are crucial for it, is that if A and B are hereditarily atomic Neumann algebras, then the category is, uh, uh, the category, uh, sorry, each uh, home object of the category has the structure of a continuous uh, Kegel Spitz, whereas before we only knew uh, that we had uh, the structure of a Kegel Spitz. So here, in order to prove the continuity, we extended the result of uh, Peter Selinger, who proved that the unit interval of uh, every hereditarily atomic von Neumann algebra is a, is a domain. But this is an internal property of the object, whereas here in this theorem, we extended it from, well, from, the, from a property of an object to the entire category, essentially. Then, in our Lix paper, we, from our Lix paper last year, we knew that um, the allenberg moore category of the monad is isomorphic to the category of continuous Kegel Spitzen, which called continuous maps that are linear in the sense that they preserve the uh, convex structure. And then if you combine the two results, and well, you do some additional work, you can then prove that you have a nice barycenter map, beta here, that tells you how you can uh, essentially flatten the convex structure, like the classical convex structure of M, when applied to the quantum convex structure of Q, onto the latter one. And you do this in a nice way, you can define it such that this is uh, Scott continuous, it's linear, and furthermore, also has a structure of, of an eilenberg moore algebra. Uh, yeah, so I would say these are the crucial theorems. So since I am badly out of time again, uh, here for the interpretation of observable types, we use the L infinity functor, and we draw some connections to the discrete uh, subprobability distribution monad on, uh, uh, on, on, on set. Um, and this is sufficient for the observable types, which again are a, a nice uh, subset. And this, uh, well, basically these are isomorphisms that we uh, establish here, satisfy some very nice coherence conditions from previous work that uh, we've done. 
For dynamic lifting, um, well, here I've written how the operational semantics looks like. Essentially, what you, when, you, when you lift a value, you have to do the translation and then do the nonlinear substitution of the translated value, which, is, which can now be seen as a piece of classical information. And here you have to use a certain, uh, well, a certain Scott continuous and natural bijection, which you can construct from the structure of uh, uh, these adjunctions uh, here together with some more work. Well, anyway, so since I'm uh, out of time, I actually was able to say almost everything I wanted anyway. Uh, finally, we proved that the system is type safe, which means that if you program here, you're not going to produce any runtime errors. So it's, it's nice. You're not going to get stuck. Things make sense. You're not going to run into bugs if it type checks. Uh, and we enter the notational interpretation is uh, sound and strongly adequate. So I already explained what strong adequacy means before and soundness. So this is a nice uh, thing to have if you wish to talk about program logics uh, and uh, reason about your system and so on. Uh, so here, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about this because I'm out of time. For future work, we would like to consider uh, higher order lambda abstractions on the quantum side together with recursive types there. And if you care about the details, the paper is published at uh, POPO uh, 22. So thank you for your attention. OK, we have time for a few questions. Robert. Um, so I was um, looking at the type system a little bit. Um, and so it seems like you have you know, this uh, largely, you, know, you have this linear system, and you can you can wrap it and and turn it into something that is persistent. Similar, um, is this is this based on like Benton's linear nonlinear logic? Um, uh, yeah, here here the, there are strong connections to Benton's uh, linear nonlinear logic. That's true, uh, but it's uh, it's so basically because of what I said. You know, here I did say that we don't technically have a model of intuitionistic linear logic. So because of this, uh, this rule here has been restricted to observable types. Right? Whereas if you consider Benton's linear nonlinear logic, then well, there will not be any restrictions on uh, on the types that you you, you can lift. So you you will be able to do it in a more general sense. Uh -huh. yeah. But okay. here the like, we we are basically forced to do it if you wish to accommodate this uh, semantic model. Um. Uh, if I can ask, can I ask another quick question? Or um, yes. um, what um, you talked a little bit about adding recursion, and that tends to be a little bit tricky. You would have to start thinking about um, like fixed points and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about like have you started working on that? Do you, about you... uh, type recursion. Uh, uh, okay, but here, what do you mean by type recursion? Do you mean uh... Uh, no? You, um, on the last slide, you have you have a next. Um, you have future work um, here. Yeah. Oh, recursive types. Interesting. Yeah. So here, what we have in the what we have in the papers, what what has been published, is that we have recursive types on the classical side. So there, we don't have any restrictions. Now, on the quantum side, we have inductive types. So basically, what you can do is uh, you can compute type fixed points as long as you don't allow the bang modality or the Wally pop or the linear implication, right? So th those we know how to interpret in this model. Now, if you wish to add those then I don't know of any semantic models that can accommodate this and at the same time have quantum measurements. Uh, what, what would they look like? Why do, you, why do you want these types? Sorry? Why do you, like, what, 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 do the, what would these types look like? What, what are you going for? Well, for example, if you, if you have this, then you'll be able to represent a stream of uh, qubits, let's say. So you can have a function that, uh, yeah, you, you can just represent, a, I mean, currently you can represent a stream of bits, like classical bits, or let's say booleans, just in the usual way, because it's a call by value system, and then you can you know, write a function that uh, would then uh, give you like uh, the head of the stream and then return another function that will give you the rest and so on. So you, you will, in principle, be able to do this uh, with qubits if you're able to pull it off somehow. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> would be cool, but yeah, but I don't see how this can be achieved currently. So. <laughs> I, neither do I. We can do one more quick question, if there is one. Yep. While we are talking about future work, can you talk a little bit about 
the difficulty to accommodate a higher order abstraction, lambda abstraction? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, so if you want to obtain, if you just want to add high order quantum lambda abstractions, but then remove recursive types, then okay, there we do have some models. So actually, I think we have several. So this can be achieved, right? So this, this has been done and then you can take, uh, you can take care of uh, measurements and so on. Now, it's just that the combination of the two is like problematic. And actually here, if you, so if we go back, if you consider, uh, let's say, uh, actually you can just take this model here. So, so this already has uh, sufficient structure to interpret the quantum lambda calculus without recursion. So if you remove recursion, then this is already good and there is a paper on the archive where this is done. It's by uh, Kenta Cho and one of the Westerbaum brothers, but I forgot uh, which one. Okay. So, sorry? Bram, okay. No, no more questions. Sorry, Glenn. Uh, we, can, uh, discuss, uh, we can discuss afterwards. So thanks yeah. very much, Vladimir, and we'll go to the next talk. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Lilian Joy-Gondi, a master's student in uh, EPFL in Switzerland and Ecole Polytechnique in France. I worked on this project during a master internship at INRIA, the French National Institute for Computer Science with Emmanuel Jandel and Vladimir Jamjev that you just heard before. Um, so I will now present our work on Chimera, which is um, a library implemented in the Idris 2 language for types of variational quantum programming. So a few programming languages have already been implemented in both industry and academia. But the main problem with these languages is that they are not type safe which means that some programs uh, which may not be compliant with the laws of quantum physics may not be at compile time and then raise error at runtime. And our aim is to reject all of these programs at compile time. We mainly focused on variational quantum programs that are hybrid classical quantum programs. And here, the main challenge is to be able to manipulate both quantum and classical data even if they have very different behaviors. Um, in our approach, we take the point of view of a programmer on a classical computer um, who will send some instruction to a quantum computer through a communication protocol and will then all the results of the quantum computation uh, all on his classical computer. And for our implementation, we chose the Idris 2 language because it's a functional language that has two notable features, dependent types and linearity, that will allow us to uh, reject all these program, the, these wrong programs uh, at compile time. Well, the first step for, uh, for our language is to be able to build quantum circuits. So here by quantum circuit, we only think in terms of gates and wires. So these are all the mathematical unitary operators and we'll leave the notion of applying them to qubits for later. So for these unitary operators, uh, we created a new data type, which is called unitary. And we use the first feature of Idris2, which is dependent types. So what is a dependent type? Basically, in Idris2, um, a type can be parameterized by a value, and this will allow um, the compiler to, um, to perform more. Uh, type checks. So here, for example, we parameterize our quantum circuits by the number of wires. And here, if we wish to apply a Hadamard gate on one of the wires, we um, just have to give the index of the wire and the compiler will infer a proof that this index is indeed correct and that the circuit can be built. Um, we also implemented um, the basic operations such as composition, tensor product, or adjoint. So here, as an example, we can build a small circuit just by adding an Hadamard gate on one wire and a control knot gate. Um, now that we have our circuits, we can focus on um, applying them to qubits and more generally, uh, manipulate quantum information. 
So as I said before, the main challenge here is to be able to manipulate both quantum and classical data, even if, if the behavior, behaviors are very different. And in particular, we want to deal with all the specificities of quantum computing without impacting classical uh, computations. Um, so the main theorem that we want to enforce is the non-cloning theorem. And to prevent um, uh, qubit copying, we use the sec second feature of Idris 2, which is uh, linearity. Um, so basically, linearity is uh, something that will make uh, that at, comp at compile time, the compiler will check that some resources are used only once. So this is perfect for enforcing the non-cloning theorem because it will prevent qubit copying. Um, created a new interface that we call quantum op that defines preci precisely all the operations that we are allowed to do with qubits. So we are um, allowed to create new qubits in state zero. We can apply a unitary circuit as defined before to some of the qubits, and we can measure the qubits. And in this interface, so in all these functions, a linearity on qubits is enforced. Well, let's have an example of how it works. So we implemented the QAOA, which is a variational algorithm that approximates solution for combinatorial optimization problem. And we particularly focused on the max cut problem because it's a famous problem uh, solved by QAOA. So how does it work? It's basically a back and forth process between quantum computation and classical optimization. So first, for the quantum part, we have to prepare what is called the trial state. So it consists of um, applying a unitary operator to some qubits, to n qubits on the plus state. So this unitary operator is just a composition of operators of depth p. And the particularity of these operators is that they're parameterized by some classical parameters that here are the beta j and gamma j. Then these qubits are measured and um, the result is fed to a classical optimizer that will then output the new parameters, betas and gammas, for the next trial state. So the process is repeated several times. Let's now have a look at the code. So first, we want to um, define uh, the unitary operators that we need for preparing the trial state. So the first one is the mixing unitary operator that takes as input this uh, classical parameter beta. And it just consists of a tensor product of n times the Rx, uh, Rx gate with this beta parameter. The second one is the cost uh, unitary operator. This one is a little bit more complicated because it depends on the graph. So we have to give the graph here as inputs. Um, in Idris 2, we define the graph also using dependent types, which make them quite compatible with the algorithms and all the checks done at compile time. And it also takes this classical param uh, gamma parameter. Um, then uh, we can write the function that will create the whole circuit. So it takes as input this classical betas and gammas parameter of depth p. And then we just make the composition of all the unitary operator. Here the dot is the composition um, unit, uh, operator. Um, then the next step is to perform the classical optimization. So how does it work? We just give the graph and the information from all the previous computation. And this classical optimizer will output um, the vector, the new vector of beta and gamma parameters. Um, here, as our aim was to show that um, quantum and classical computation could be mixed together nicely, we did not implement the classical optimizer. We just return some random parameters, uh, but it was not the aim of our experience. And finally, so this is the most interesting function because this is where everything will interact together. So we first um, make a recursive call um, to get all the information from the previous computation. And then here we give it to a classical, uh, the classical optimizer along with the graph to get the new vector of parameters. And then we used the um, unitary data type and the function that we have created before to create our circuits. 
So this is all classical computation that keeps unchanged. And then we will enter all the, um, the quantum computation. So this is all done inside this run function that is here to enforce linearity. So first we create um, n new qubits. Then we apply the circuit to all these uh, to the qubits, and then we measure them all, and we get the classical result here that we return in the function. So as you can notice, we the classical and quantum computation are separated, so that linearity is only enforced on the quantum computation and not on the classical computation. Uh, we can also make a quick execution of the algorithm. So here we have a graph with five vertices and these edges. Here we can print um, an example of the operators for the trial states. And finally, we can uh, run 10 iterations of the algorithm and then get the gut. So yeah, to conclude, we have implemented this library for support for both classical and quantum programming um, by answering all the specificities of quantum programming and without impacting classical programming that allowed us to implement some variational algorithms inside, inside this type safe framework. So for future work, we would like to implement some other variational algorithms using this library and something else that we would like to do because for now, we, as we don't have our own quantum computer, we only simulated all the quantum operations. But of course, if this could be done with another implementation of the interface with the quantum computer, it would be nicer. Um, if you want some more information, you can find the source code on GitHub and the results on the archive. So thank you for your attention and I can answer some questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Lilian. Uh, questions from the audience? We have a bit of time. I'm going to come to you next. Anyone else? OK, you're first, Robert. Um, maybe to steal Frank Foos or somebody else's thunder, there's been a lot of discussion of dynamic lifting at this conference so far. I was wondering, does Chimera support it, or is there a reason that it was uh, difficult to support um, in the language? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the beginning well. For support for what, sorry? Um, for dynamic lifting, for being able to do a classical computation and then continue with the, the quantum state that you already had. Uh, yeah, so we implemented some algorithms like repeat until success that use this dynamic lifting. Um, well, I don't have the, the example here, but yeah, normally because uh, we could make uh, classical and quantum computation interact together, and we have full support for classical computation that allows us for, well, general recursion, and then, yeah. Okay, so there's more than you showed, which was just initialize unitary yeah. measure. You can actually do quite a bit more. Cool. Go to Frank for a sec. If you could uh, just say your name when you ask the question, because the camera points. Hi, Lillian. Uh, I'm Frank Fu. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I can see that you can use dependent type to account for the indexing and things. I wonder if there are any other use of dependent type uh, in practice in your situation. Um, so yeah, we use dependent types for um, for unitaries. Then we use uh, mainly dependent types for for what, as I said, um, defining other parameters for prog prog problems. For example, here we define the graphs for depend with dependent types. Uh, we also use them. Um, well, this is I didn't enter these details, but we use them also uh, for effectful quantum operations. Um, just because we are, we have a lot more uh, functions to define how we want to apply all the unitary circuits to the qubits and how we manage uh, the qubits. And to this end, we use more dependent types. 
Okay, thanks. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was uh, asking about the categorical semantics of uh, variational <laughs> model. I'm, I don't think you work on this topic, but do you ha uh, have a categorical semantic for IDRIS and does it help to use these semantics to get a, uh, very, uh, semantics for a variational quantum? programming languages? To be honest, I don't know much about categories because I haven't studied them, so I don't think I can answer really your question. <laughs> well, that was the previous talk, right? Like... <laughs> so the previous talk was about semantics, but okay, there's no... Nicely, and I think that's all we have time for right now. So let's say thank you once more. Hi, everyone. Today I would like to present uh, our work on formalizing the Q-sharp programming language. And uh, I hope to convince you that Q-sharp is an Algol-like language as well. Uh, this is joint work with Kesha Haitala from University of Maryland, Sarah Marshall from Microsoft Quantum, and Robert Wren uh, from University of Chicago. So uh, QSharp is a programming language for quantum computing from Microsoft announced in 2017. It's really a F-sharp-like language, but it, on the cover, it looks like a C-sharp-like language. And there's a nice blog post in top by John Azaria, one of the developers of QSharp, that explains the evolution of the language. Uh, the model used by the language is a usual QRAM, where quantum computer is considered as a coprocessor. And then it has several interesting algo-like features, which are uh, very nice as a programming language as person to me. So it clearly separates between classical functions uh, and uh, quantum operations in the syntax of the language. Then the, all the computation on the quantum machine is done by side effects. So effectively, the quantum operations that we see in the language are monadic sequence of instructions. And our work kind of exposes that, which I'll show you. Other nice features are that most things are immutable by default in the language, and there are features for a metaprogramming, such as you can automatically generate and joint and control versions of the operations. So here's a sample program in, tel to, in Q Sharp to show teleportation. So I'll not go through all the details, but a couple of things to highlight are uh, that Q Sharp is uh, parametric on the gauge set. So even to use the basic gauge, we have to import a library. Uh, the other thing to notice is that, uh, like I mentioned, the computation is by side effects. So in this entangle function, the two qubits for Alice and Bob are passed, and we are just applying operations on them. Notice that there is no qubit being returned. Uh, this is the monadic interface in play here. There's no linearity involved. So qubits are passed by reference. You perform a computation in place and uh, trivial unit. Moving on, um, why do we even need to do some, uh, why, why do we need to specify q -sharp, right? So in, it's very well known in uh, programming languages community that if you have a good foundation for a language, you can easily write and maintain programs in it. And there are several examples of languages being formalized. Uh, Well-known ones, the standard ML that we will follow in this work. There's Java Go, uh, JS, and Rust. Uh, so other thing to note is that uh, Q-sharp is a new and evolving language, and there's a design principle from Bettina Heim's thesis says it's a living body of work which will grow. So our work is aligned with the goals of the language. Uh, so having a well-founded meta theory will help it evolve. Um, so this is a general recipe we, we, we followed, uh, which was uh, designed by uh, people working on standard ML, uh, Harper and Stone in 2000. So, uh, you know, every language ultimately has a small language inside of it, which is uh, which, which shows its core. So that's the first step. You design a well-behaved or well-typed internal language. In our case, it's, we are calling it Lambda QSharp. Then the second step is that you define a relation from a uh, translation relation from the surface language or external language to this core. And the advantage now is that once you have this code, you can do all of your statics and dynamics, which means you know the type system and defining the behavior of the programs on the smaller core and prove theorems on top of that. 
The other exam, uh, other thing we can do is now we can easily extend the surface language and see how it affects the core language and study the extensions and variations. So to motivate that in our work, uh, here are a couple of programs in q which are invalid and should not be allowed by the compiler. Controlling operation, which uh, takes a qubit, creates a new qubit, makes a copy of that. So this is just copying the qubit and then applies C0. So this is using a same the same qubit as both the control and target of C0, which is effectively uh, cloning the qubit. Uh, but it currently passes the QSharp type checker and fails at runtime in the simulator. Um, similarly, on the right, you see a, a function which creates a qubit and immediately returns the rest to it. So this should also be disallowed because QSharp has this lexical scoping of uh, lifetimes of qubits. So wherever they are created, they are uh, discarded in the same lexical scope. But this is again allowed by the language currently, should be, which should be invalid. So in our work, we, we are able to uh, solve these problems and I'll show you how. So here is uh, Lambda Q sharp, uh, our core calculus, and I will go through the grammar of types and expressions and commands. So uh, the types are pretty simple. There are function types, there are product types, booleans, units, and there's one for commands because this is a monadic language. The most important type here is the QREF type, which is indexed. It, it, it is a qubit reference type to model qubits in QSharp. Uh, the important thing is it is indexed by these orange color symbols Q, which represent a single logical qubit. And we are able to statically track identities of these qubits. This notion comes from something called alias types back in 2000. And the idea goes even further on something called singleton types. Um, moving on to expressions, I'll not go through these details, but this is the usual simply type lambda calculus with uh, encapsulated commands. Uh, so we, our lambda q sharp language is built upon uh, Harper's language modernized alcohol from his book. Um, so this is very simple. Uh, now this is the more interesting part, uh, commands. So we have the monadic return and bind as usual. And then we have quantum specific commands. So the first one is new QREF, which creates a new qubit reference. And again, the key idea in this setup is that we, we have enforced the binding structure of the command in, the, in, in its uh, syntax itself. So we see that uh, the scope of qubit X is limited to the command M. And that way we can easily enforce a strict static uh, stack-like discipline on uh, lifetime of qubits. And we'll see how that helps. There's the gate application command. Um, given a unitary gate, you can apply it to an expression. Then there is there is this diagonal application. This is a interesting uh, syntactic sugar, which is used for modeling controlled gates, where the you know the first e1 is representing a control and e2 represents the target qubits. And if the control is zero, you apply the first unitary. If it's one, then you apply the second unitary. And that's the usual measurement. So now let's look at uh, some of the typing commands. And I'll actually not go through any of these commands in details. I just wanted to understand the typing judgment and what's happening overall in most of these. And then we'll look at some examples in later slides. So the idea is that uh, apart from the context gamma in our typing judgment, we have this, uh, this notion called signature sigma, which is also indexing the judgment. And the way to read this is that this command M uh, is a well from command returning a value of type tau with respect to the context gamma and the signature sigma. So the role of sigma is to keep track of the qubit symbols that I mentioned, the orange colored qubit symbols. Uh, and each of the qubit symbols in this sigma will be distinct. That is, there is no duplication. And you see, uh, I'll, I'll just show you this example real quick. So when we create a new qubit reference, a fresh qubit Q is allocated, added to the signature, uh, sigma comma Q, and then uh, it's bound to this variable X. And in this extended context with the binding X and qubit Q, this command M would be uh, well formed. Okay. So let's let's move on and see uh, how these uh, you know things help us prevent some of the problems in QSharp. 
So here is the program we saw before to clone qubits. And in our Lambda QSharp syntax, it looks like this. You create a new qubit, then you return the value of uh, executing the following command, make a copy of the qubit. So this says let q2 equal to q1, and then execute the following command, which is digap i2 comma x. And the C0 that we see here gets translated into uh, you know, applying identity on zero and X on one. So what happens? So here's the rule that we saw in the previous slide for diagonal gate application. Notice that uh, our rule requires that all of these RIs, uh, qubits, should be distinct I from one to N, and the control qubit Q should also be distinct from R. This is a requirement from the signature. We said the signature keeps only distinct qubits. So now when we execute through this program in our um, Lambda Q sharp syntax, we will realize that Q1 type is QRef Q1 and Q2, which was just a copy of the reference, also has the same type. So this rule does not apply and the type checker gives you an error. So this program is invalid in Lambda Q sharp, right? Uh, looking at the other example, uh, it's very simple. Uh, the equivalent is creating an qubit and returning the reference immediately. So the rule we saw earlier, uh, what happens is when you are in the premise of the rule, this command, this typing is valid, that the type of return x is qrefq because q is part of the signature here. But when we reach the conclusion, this q has disappeared because uh, of the static discipline that the language maintains and is visible in the syntax of the language. So then the then this type, which we see for the output, is invalid, and uh, we get a type error. So this is just a sampling. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do more in Q Sharp. So currently, our solution does not support arrays, which are which are a common feature in Q Sharp. So we would like to extend our work to that. And there are other major Q Sharp features, such as automatic generation of joins. We would like to see if we can uh, do it in a more type safe manner. Then we are working on mechanization of the meta theory. Other long term uh, goals are to do semantics preserving compilation to languages like QIR and from a verified tool chain using existing projects such as Vellum. Um, to conclude, uh, we think that both Lambda QSharp and QSharp are algon like languages. And what I mean by that is that they safely combine pure and effectful computation together, which is distinct uh, nature, essence of algon like languages. And similarly, they also enforce strict uh, stack discipline for memory management. Uh, please see the paper for more details. We also have a very nice equational semantics based on a fully complete equational theory by Sam Staten and then elaboration rules. Uh, and there is the paper on the archive or on the website. And I would love to take some questions. And we have some time for one or two questions. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, Vladimir. Uh, I have a question about your uh, judgment for new qubit references. So if you go back a few slides. Ah, okay. Yeah. So there, uh, you write the, the signature notation below the turnstile. But uh, this makes me think that there might be some connection between what you're doing in uh, dual intuitionistic linear logic, where basically the sigma and the Q can be seen as a linear context. Uh, does this make sense? Have you considered this? Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, the sigma, as formally defined, is, uh, is one can think of it as a stack. It's just collecting qubits and removing them but it does not have any structural properties associated with it. So you're right that there, there must be some connection which we have not investigated. Thanks. Hi, hi Karthik, Robin Sales. Um, so you mentioned uh, adjoints. So do you support adjoints? Uh, not right now, that's our future work. Okay, so what would it take for you to support adjoints? Do you have any uh, well, idea? There are, yes, yes. Uh, so there are a couple of issues with Q-sharps adjoints. Uh, so 
it's easy to support the easiest version where they have you know you only have unit three operations in a sequential manner in the operation in a given operation but q sharp claims to support at joins in some other more interesting cases as well such as when measurement is involved or classical computation is involved so that requires a little more careful work which we are yet to do but that's certainly plan in future okay thanks and i think we can do one more Um, okay, if there's no more questions, then I'll say thank you to Kartik and all the other speakers, and we can wrap the session.